Hello friends and welcome back to my channel on philosophy and artificial intelligence. I'm Casey Hartz. I'm a philosopher and an ontologist and in this video I'm going to give you three more ways to think about what an ontology is and how you can use it. A good ontology is three things. It's a language, it's a graph in the sense of being a mathematical object with nodes and edges, and it's a model of reality. And we'll look at each of those in turn and think about how those shape the way you build and use an ontology, as well as how you maybe shouldn't use that ontology. Before we get into those, a couple of preliminaries. So uh, in the first video, which you should go back and watch if you haven't yet, we covered what an ontology is. It provides a web of concepts so that the artificial intelligence can understand your data or act as if it were understanding your data. And an ontology, maybe more formally is a set of n tuples, usually triples. What does that mean? Things like this. So Mozart was born in Salzburg. Salzburg is located in Austria and the magic flute was created by Mozart. And when we talk later about these triples being in a graph, you might represent them this way, where we've got a couple of nodes connected by an edge to say that Don Giovanni was created by Mozart. Another warning, as far as I'm concerned in this talk, ontology, knowledge graph, taxonomy, semantic data, I'm gonna use all of those terms interchangeably. Those terms aren't really interchangeable. Different people use them with slightly different meanings or maybe drastically different meanings or at least different flavors. But for the purpose of this video, nothing is meant significantly about the differences between the two, except briefly I'll talk about the specific interpretation of taxonomy. So there's this cartoon about an elephant. You've got a bunch of blind people who go up and try and say, what's going on here? What is this object? And someone feels the trunk and says, oh, well, this is maybe a snake. And someone feels a leg. No, it's a tree. Someone else feels the tail and thinks it's a rope, right? But of course, they're just getting a different sort of isolated, narrow picture of what the elephant is before them. And the elephant is really the combination of all of those things. It has all of those individual features. And in this talk, I want to look at the three different aspects of ontology. An ontology is not just a language, it's not just a graph, it's not just a model of reality, but if we think of each of those different aspects of being sort of a facet of a good ontology, that might help you understand how, a, how an ontology functions. Ontology is a language. So n-tuples are sentences. When we said Mozart lives in Austria or was born in Austria, that's a sentence. That's the kind of thing I can express in natural language. It's the kind of thing we can represent in our ontology language. And when you build an ontology, you have to create the terms and define them that people are going to be using. So you're building a language. This language then generates a standard vocabulary. This is one of the really useful aspects of building an ontology in a company organization is you force people to get clear. What do we care about? What do I mean when I say this is a uh, operation or when I say that this is a health code violation or when I say that this is one of our parameters? Let's get precise. Let's write it down. Let's know what we're talking about. An ontology is a language that forces you to get clear on that terminology. And one of my first jobs when I worked at Sycor, they talked about English zero. So whenever you do a project, you'd write out in English, here are the things that I want the ontology to know. At the end of this, the AI needs to be able to say that there's a block on the table and the block is to the left of the stapler. Or I need to be able to say that this healthcare provider uses this uh, payer. If you can say in natural language what you need to be able to express, then you have the, the job that your ontology needs to be able to express. Your language needs to be at least as good as saying these things. An ontology is unique in that it's a human readable language, but it also needs to be a machine readable language. And for the most part, I think about how humans are gonna be able to use my, my program because if I've represented it in the, in the graph in the right sorts of way, ways, the machine will be able to handle it. But on the human readable side, we need to make sure that we're using labels that are really intuitive. So if you have the perfect number of terms in all the right spots, but the labels are strange and humans don't know what they're supposed to mean, they won't use them in the right ways and then you've wasted your time. You also need to avoid collisions. We can say bank, but I might mean the financial institution, I might mean the, the edge of the river, right? Or I can use names. Right. Well, we might have more than one Casey in our database, and so we have to be careful that we don't just use first names. Right. Um, and there's always this 
balance between how can I make my names long enough to be unique, but short enough that they feel intuitive. And that's a, that's a hard balance to strike. There's also a difficulty of figuring out how many different terms to put in your ontology. So the more terms, the more words you have, the more things that you can say, the more expressive your vocabulary is. That's great because expressive languages allow us to say more things and be more particular and specific, but it makes it harder for people to learn, right? So the most precise language in the world might be one that nobody could possibly master in any reasonable amount of time. So how do you balance it? How do you think about the trade-offs? But our language also needs to be machine readable. And the biggest way that this manifests itself is people make a new term and they write a comment and they say, this is what I mean by that term. But from the computer's perspective, they now just have a comment that sits next to it. The computer can't parse or read or understand that comment. And so you need to make sure you enforce that comment. So if I say that foxes are a specific type of vertebrate, then I better make sure that I have a node for fox and a nose for ver a node uh, although foxes also have noses, and a node for vertebrate, and I've connected those in the right sorts of ways. One helpful aspect of thinking about an ontology as a language is you can think of it as the interlingua, the central language that all the rest of your data is translated into. So imagine, uh, and you probably don't have to imagine very hard if you have some sort of business enterprise where you have data, because your data lives in all sorts of different places. It lives in spreadsheets. It lives in uh, a relational database somewhere. It lives on individual people's hard drive. If we're thinking about a healthcare setting, we might have data that comes off of our equipment that's stored in some particular place, like our x-ray machines and like what their calibration is or when they were last serviced. We have information in individual charts for our patients. We have some of that stored in our EHR, EMR, through HL7 messages all of these different places. And if you want to ask questions about that data and connect them together, you need to make sure you have translations between each of these different data sets. And that's great if you have them, but it's time consuming. You have to know which data set or which place to go look in for the data and how to translate that out into these other places. On the other hand, if we have an ontology that can sit at the center and be our centralized ideal language, our interlingua to translate all of those other sources, then every time we add a new data source, you just need to translate it once into the ontology vocabulary. And then when people want to interrogate your data, they only need to learn one language to pull information back out. They just need to understand the ontology language. Ontologies are graphs. So graph theory is a subset of mathematics. And a graph is just a collection of nodes and edges. So you see a couple on the screen up there, right? We have uh, different colored nodes. They're connected by different edges. And we can say things about those nodes. We can describe the difference or the distance between two nodes by how many different paths there are, what's the shortest path, what's the longest path, those sorts of things. An ontology, and we saw this back sort of at the beginning of the slides, right? An ontology is a graph. So we can take two nodes and they're connected by an edge. That's our triples, right? So the magic flute was composed by Mozart and Mozart is an instance of composer. And we can see that we have all the sort of properties you have in graphs. So Mozart is a node in this graph. It's got three different edges that it's connected to. Two are outgoing node uh, edges pointing towards different nodes. One's an incoming edge coming from the magic flute node, etc. So once we see that this has a mathematical structure, we can evaluate it in the sort of vocabulary that uh, graph theory and mathematics has. And this allows us to do a couple of different things. One is to think about reasoning in terms of how we traverse the graph. Since I know that Mozart was born in Salzburg, I know that he was born in Austria. Why is that? Well, because I can cross my way through the different nodes and edges in the graph to see that he was born in Austria or he was born in Salzburg, which is located in Austria, and therefore he was born in Austria. That sort of inference can be done and be thought of in terms of the graph theory application. It also allows us to assess an ontology in terms of its mathematical properties. So I could compare two ontologies and say, how many edges do they have? How many different types of edges do they have? Are they connected? Are there any gaps in the ontology or in the graph? And a really useful output of having gra ontologies be graphs is that we can identify isomorphic structures. Oftentimes I think about, okay, there are two different ways where I might want to represent something. And then I just draw out what the ontology looks like with both of those options. And I see, oh wait, those graphs look exactly the same. 
So maybe I use different terms one way or the other. Maybe I put different labels on them. But as you can see in the two graphs on the slide right now, if you have two graphs that look like that, they're functionally the same graph, right? We have uh, five different nodes. They're connected by the same number of edges. And we can do an isomorphic translation from one to the other. So if you're building your ontology and you have the situation where you can't decide which of two isomorphic structures to choose, just pick one. You can always translate it into the other one later. A good ontology is a model. So imagine we have some real world situation, someone's getting a vaccine, and we want to express this in our ontology. We can sort of overlay the graph, the sort of mathematical structure that we thought of from the last one on top of this picture, right? What's going on? It's a vaccination. There are role players in this vaccination. We have our patient Susie. We have our nurse Leon. He's holding Syringo 5, which contains the vaccine. We know that vaccine is being administered to patient Susie. And all of these things are sort of subparts of this single overarching event. When I think about an ontology being a model, that brings to mind a couple of important things for the way I'm structuring it. So first off, I want my model to look like the world. So imagine that we're building a, a car and we want to know what its air resistance is. Is it aerodynamic or not? Well, if I'm going to build that model, it's got to look like the car is going to look in the real world. But it's going to be a simplification of what we see in the real world. So building that car, I don't need to make sure that its center console is just right or that its seats are leather, right? Unless it's a convertible and somehow the air is getting in there and affecting the seats. Now, I just need to make sure the outside contours are exactly like the real world car so I know how it's behaving in wind but I don't want these to be oversimplifications. So maybe if I want to use this model later to see how many passengers can fit in the car, whether the car behaves differently uh, when there are lots of people in it, how does it affect the suspension? Well, if I oversimplified my model and didn't build out any of the interior or didn't think at all about the axles or suspension when I was putting stuff in, then my model is not going to be useful for that task. When you build a model, you should be thinking about what you're going to use that model for. Same thing goes for an ontology. So if I create an ontology to process patient data in a healthcare example, that's great. I know I have to be able to store that patient data, but what am I storing it for? Am I going to be telling those patients what their healthcare history looks like? Am I going to be using it to do research on possible cures, which drugs are effective in treating a particular condition? Whatever the case may be, think about what am I doing this for and make sure that you have enough hooks or structure to your data so that you can answer those questions. And this just goes back to how simplified do I make it? If we can answer all those questions with a pretty simple, lightweight model, great. But if we want to reuse that model or do, it, do other things with it, then we need to make sure the model is complex enough to be able to handle those other use cases down the road, which is why you need to keep your mind open. It's not just what am I going to do with it right now, although that's a good driving force for how we should structure it, but also what could I use it for tomorrow? If I'm taking all the time to build this model, let's make it reusable. Let's be able to do a few more things with it. And that's it. Those are the three aspects of ontology I wanted to emphasize today. So a good ontology is a language that allows you to express your data within a graph structure that gives you an accurate model of reality. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you now know a little bit more about what ontologies are. Make sure to like and subscribe, throw some more questions in the comments. And in the next video, we're going to dive into what an owl ontology looks like, a few more specifics about how you build those. Thanks. Till next time.